Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Matthew Silverman, the director of the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our conversation with Michelle Goldhaber, titled Amidst the Sunflowers, A Journey of Jewish-Ukrainian Relations, Research, and Resilience. We hope this talk will give you another perspective on Jewish life in Ukraine, both prior to this terribly traumatic time and to the current situation. We only have an hour together, so I'll keep my intro short and welcome Becky Levy, our Program and Communications Director, who will be in conversation with our speaker. For those of you who have attended other programs, Becky is one of our behind the scenes staff members, making sure everything runs as smoothly as possible. Today, she joins us in front of the camera. Welcome, Becky. Thank you, Matt, and welcome again to everyone joining us today. I'm delighted to introduce you to our speaker, Michelle Goldhaber. Michelle is a third year rabbinical student at Hebrew College Rabbinical School in Newton, Massachusetts. She has spent years as a professional facilitator in the US and abroad, holding dialogues with Israelis and Palestinians, leading groups on experiential educational treks in the wilderness, running spiritual retreats, teaching workshops, mediating conflicts in court and public speaking. She is a social entrepreneur who founded a nonprofit in 2008 dedicated to building bridges between people of different backgrounds. Michelle lived in Lviv, Ukraine for 12 years, first on a Fulbright and then independently doing work and research in Jewish-Ukrainian relations and building partnerships between the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv and Hebrew College in Newton. She sees herself as an ambassador between the Jewish and Ukrainian worlds, as well as within the greater pluralistic human community. Michelle is a mystic and believes we each have the opportunity to reflect our own facet of the divine on earth. It is my unique honor to welcome Michelle to our Haberman Institute community today, as she and I, as she and I met at fresh, as freshmen at Boston University and spent time at Hebrew University together as well. When Michelle graduated from BU with a degree in music and comparative spirituality and went on to receive her master's in social work from Simmons College and then a master's in divinity from Harvard, she was the friend who helped keep my feet off the ground, encouraging by example to search and question. That dynamic has continued and evolved. Today, I know her to be a colleague and a friend who helps ground the community around her with her unique experiences and insight. So with that, I'll turn the Zoom box over to Michelle, who will begin today's program sharing her story of how she found herself working in Ukraine and the impact her experiences in Lviv had on her personal and professional story. If you have questions during today's talk, please enter them in the Q&A box. So with that, let's get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky, for such a warm introduction. And um, it is such a pleasure to um, be with you and be in conversation with you today. And um, thank you to everybody at the Haberman Institute for having me. I'm very honored to be spending this time with you. And um, very honored to be sharing about my experiences um, in Lviv, in Ukraine, and um, on my Jewish journey as such. So um, going back to when this all started, the year was 2002. I was um, just in the beginning of my time at Divinity School, and I was studying religion and peace building. And um, I was taking all different wonderful course courses um, on ethnography and religion and conflict, religion and politics. And um, at the same time, I was doing a lot of ballroom dancing. And uh, this was how I got my exercise and my social time in. I was a competitive ballroom dancer with a partner who was Ukrainian American. And um, we used to have lots of interesting conversations about our different cultural backgrounds. And um, what impressed me was actually how similar they were um, he went to Yuki school growing up and I went to Hebrew school growing up. Um, he attended Ukrainian camps in the summer. I went to Jewish camps. Uh, we both had instilled in us very similar values about um, preserving our heritage and what it meant to be an ethnic or religious minority in America. So it was really interesting to me to discover that um, my ideas and my experience of peoplehood growing up really transcended the particular people that I was a part of. Um, so, you know, at the same time, I'm, I'm studying all of these things at Divinity School and having these interesting conversations with my dance partner. 
And then one day he comes to practice wearing a t-shirt that had horsemen on them with some Ukrainian writing. And, you know, I said, oh, so what's on your t-shirt today? He always had different Ukrainian t-shirts. And he said, oh, those are the Cossacks. They're our national hero. And I said, oh, surely those can't be the same Cossacks who burned and pillaged my ancestors' villages. And he said, well, uh, actually, yep, <laughs> same ones. So this was a really important moment for me because all of a sudden what I had thought was some really nice, pleasant um, confluence between our experiences all of a sudden became something really troubling. And um, you know, for whatever reason, I had grown up um, pretty sheltered from some of the stereotypes that some Jews have of Ukrainians and some Ukrainians have of Jews. Um, up until that point, you know, my brother's best friend was Ukrainian. They used to hang out together all the time. I'd known about Chernobyl, but I didn't really know too much about Ukraine. And so I launched myself into this self-study. Um, late at night, I would do research on the side about Ukrainian Jewish relations, um, going way back into history. Um, and then one of my teachers noticed my interest and suggested that I do some of this research um, in Boston with the Ukrainian community in Boston. And so I, I did that as well. And that evolved, that became very interesting. The, the subject at the time was religion, health and healing. So I was looking at things through that lens. And um, then I um, was encouraged to apply for and then received a grant to actually go to Ukraine that summer. And that was when things really changed for me. So the, the grant was on looking at pilgrimage places of different religious groups in Ukraine, including Jewish pilgrimage places, like a lot of the graves of the Hasidic masters um, who lived and worked in Ukraine, and looking at the Greek Catholic pilgrimage places and some of the Orthodox Christian pilgrimage places. So I was on this fieldwork tour around the country um, and, very, very interestingly, you know, kind of thinking about my own family heritage at the same time and how my grandmother was born in what is now Ukraine, but was always referred to in my family as Russia, because when she was born, it was part of the Russian Empire. And we don't know too much about her life there. She left when she was a baby. Um, we knew that she fled in the middle of the night um with her family and that the Cossacks were coming and they were recruiting or conscripting men into the army and things were quite dangerous and when they got to America they never wanted to talk about it and they um wanted their kids just to speak English so I grew up knowing a few words in what I now know was part Russian part Ukrainian um and some Yiddish but really there was a big rupture in the family. And so I thought a lot on that first trip in Ukraine about what would they think about me going back to this place where they all fled from. This was not a place they spoke of warmly or with any kind of nostalgia at all. Um, so here I was in the middle of Ukraine thinking about Jewish Ukrainian relations, thinking about my own ancestry, thinking about my deep desire to be a peace builder and to work on reconciliation with you know, any group, but particularly Jewish, Jewish Ukrainian groups. And um, at one of the places I visited, uh, one of the Greek Catholic places, pilgrimage places, um, there was a holy icon there. Um, and there was miraculous water that according to the guy who was you know, kind of the local historian um, had been poisoned, the water had been poisoned by the Jews. The Jews had poisoned the well, and this was sort of a trope I encountered um, a couple times throughout that trip. And in my naivete and my um, you know, desire to make peace, I decided that I would um, apologize on behalf of the Jews for poisoning the well um, you know, years and years and years earlier. And in fact, I would um, accept the apology on behalf of the Jews that he was making to me for any pain and trouble in our history and so we had this wonderful, beautiful moment of reconciliation. We gave each other a hug through our translators. We had these great words. And then as soon as I got back into the car <laughs> and was back out on the dusty roads, I felt this you know, cascade of shame. And um, I was sort of appalled at myself that I had had the audacity to 
um, make peace. <laughs> and so frivolously um, try to erase these years of, of difficult history. Um, and then that, that kind of launched me into a whole, you know, course of self-reflection, introspection, um, where I really kind of um, grappled with these two tensions I was feeling with encountering some pretty difficult history, but also this drive I had to have some real reconciliation, not just these frivolous words of forgiveness and apologies and, um, but really looking more deeply and coming to terms with things and still reaching beyond our different narratives to a place of true um, human connection. And I eventually came to the realization that maybe my, my role in the Jewish world or my calling, so to speak, was to be somewhat of an ambassador, to kind of be my Jewish self in Ukraine and to be honest about who I was and what my life has been like and my ancestors' lives. Um, and then maybe bring something of Ukraine back into my Jewish communities um, in America. And so that, that vision or that calling, that understanding that I had at that time um, has pretty much persisted all these years. That was back in 2002. And it really has helped inform my professional direction since then. I fell in love with Ukraine. Um, the people I met were um, incredibly warm and hospitable to me. And um, despite some of those difficult moments when I would you know, see some swastikas graffitied on a wall someplace, um, they really um, were just like family to me and, and welcomed me in. And I decided I wanted to keep coming back. I was you know, feeling very compelled by all of these things and um, came back to study the language, came back to be an election observer during the Orange Revolution in 2004. And then um, eventually got a Fulbright to um, live in Ukraine in 2006. And um, after that, I never really left. Um, the grant ran out, I applied for an extension and then I continued living there on my own. I did a lot of work in Jewish Ukrainian relations, work and research, and also some research on pluralism in Ukraine in general. I led experiential programs for people of different ethnic and religious backgrounds and cultural backgrounds to you know, be able to break down barriers of stereotypes and different narratives and just spend time together getting to know each other. And um, eventually I began working um, with the Ukrainian Catholic University, kind of helping support their developing Jewish studies program. And when I eventually made the decision to go to rabbinical school, um, I received a grant to help develop an exchange program um, between Hebrew Hebrew College in, in Newton and the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. And um, then of course COVID happened and those plans went on hold and now here we are in, in wartime. So um, the groundswell and the interest and the motivation is still there. And um, you know, I'm very hopeful that eventually we'll be able to do some really re meaningful work together. So that was sort of a, a quick drive through. <laughs> Of, of my history there. Thank you, Michelle. That was a wonderful introduction that spanned so many decades um, of your life. I know there were so many details and stories um, weaved through, through your introduction. Um, in one of our recent conver conversations, you shared how you felt the first time you visited Ukraine. Um, you mentioned that you noted a visceral feeling of connection to the land and to the people, especially as you looked at the faces of the Ukrainians you felt could be your family. It was so interesting to me how you compared your first visits to Israel, a country you felt was more foreign when you first stepped onto the land until you settled in and found a personal connection. With this in mind, I started thinking about conversations with Jewish friends and colleagues whose families left Russia and Ukraine in, say, the 80s. And similar to your family and mine that left much earlier, um, they expressed little interest in going back, feeling that their time there was that of a visitor. So I, I understand how much of a balance that must have been for you. And I'm wondering how you feel about that today. Um, and how can we, watching the war on TV from afar, feeling a often personal connection, um, square these two personal truths or or can we not 
Yeah, I think you touch on something really interesting. Um, and it, it reminds me of the conversations I would have with my dance partner about um, kind of the, the longing and nostalgia that people had in his community to go back to Ukraine. Um, you know, he grew up, they grew up with very close ties to the land to, um, you know, they left under duress. They didn't want to leave Ukraine. Whereas I think um, by the time a lot of Jews were leaving, especially in my family and your family, um, they did not feel at home there anymore. You know, they were really um, being driven out by a lot of the violence that was occurring around them. And, you know, their Jewish identity was such that they had their own language, their own culture that was in very close proximity to Ukrainian culture. Um, and there was actually a lot more mingling than people sometimes realize, but they were quite distinct cultures and traditions um, with very long history in that place. But, um, you know, I can just speak for my own family when they left. Um, this was a place of violence, a place of discomfort. Um, you know, they, we didn't have any happy stories about people's childhoods there. Um, so it's, it's interesting now to watch what's happening and the people who are leaving, Jews, non-Jews. I mean, Ukraine is really a pluralistic place, multi-ethnic place. Um, and I have witnessed people from all different cultures and religions um, really expressing desire to go back as soon as it's possible. So I think things, I think it's a reflection of how things have really changed in Ukraine right now. Ukraine is um, actually one of the least anti-Semitic places in Europe. And it's actually quite comfortable and quite supportive of um, a multi-ethnic flourishing pluralistic society. So I think that the Jews who are there now um, are actually quite comfortable and, and happy to be there. I know several examples of um, Jews, Ukrainian Jews who at one point in their family history emigrated to Israel, but have since come back to live in Ukraine. So I think things are quite different now than they were even in the 80s um, when it was more of a, a Soviet dominated reality. And back when our people left, when it was you know, part of the Russian empire. Thank you. Um, it's it's interesting as we were preparing for this talk today. I did a lot of um, reading on my family on one side that came from Mariupol, um, and one ancestor, I believe my grandmother's aunt, spoke of her very happy childhood. Um, and when it was time to leave, when they finally got there, uh, the um, when they were finally allowed to leave and, and regroup with family that was already in Philadelphia, she mentioned visiting with, it seemed like hundreds of family members throughout different areas of Ukraine. And it really struck me how rooted they were um, before they left, which is something I hadn't really thought about um, before, just how deeply rooted the family was. Yet her narrative ended with how America embraced her and she embraced America back um, and the family never looked back. Mm. Um, so that's, you know, it's kind of a interesting parallel of how we are looking back now. And I don't know if it's the war that has forced us to, and certainly in my case, it did. I grew up knowing that my family, this side of the family was from Russia. And my father would say, well, it was Russia, it was Ukraine, you know, like th this, this is where it was <laughs> on that side. Um, but they were Jewish. Um, so that, you know, it's all part of our Jewish peoplehood stories, um, and they all seem so different and so connected. Mm -hmm. I wanted to venture into how you've spoken about your Jewish identity and similarly your family roots in Ukraine, um, and how has your Jewish identity informed your work, and how has it changed or evolved over the years that you were in Ukraine, and similarly since you've been back home, it's been a few years since you've been there, I believe, um, maybe what brought you to rabbinical school, kind of how this big part of your life has informed your Jewish life or vice versa? Mm, yeah, great question. Too much? It's a lot, but we can do it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I grew up in a family that was pretty open um, at the same time that I grew up in a family that really instilled deep Jewish values in me. And we had a very involved conservative American Jewish life. 
filled with USY and Hebrew school and camps, like I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I'm proud that my family was also quite progressive and open and supported me having friendships beyond just my Jewish friendships. I went to public schools. We were integrated in a broader community as well. Um, and so I think, and I grew up um, outside of Buffalo, New York, a place that's not um, teeming with you know, Jewish community like Boston is, for instance, where I live now. Um, so I think that experience of having such strong, a strong sense of cultural identity and religious identity, but living in a place like Buffalo really um, put in my muscle memory how to operate in both worlds, you know, how to, how to, how to be in this pluralistic environment and community and have this um, pretty strong, unique identity that was separate from the the mainstream. And so I think that is a huge part of my formative um, experience. And so I was already positioned, you know, when I went to divinity school to be studying um, many religions, to be studying religion as a concept. Um, you know, I had my own religious explorations. I dabbled in different things like a lot of Buddhist meditation, which I still do. And I was really interested in Hinduism. And that was a formative learning experience for me. Even born again Christianity was part of my journey um, and all over the, the Jewish map as well. So I was always a seeker and explorer, but um, really never wavered in my own identity. So I think um, I'm lucky to have that strong sense of who I am that has enabled me to freely explore outside of myself as well. Um, so going to, again, going to divinity school, um, I wasn't studying Judaism there. I was studying other religions or religion as a, as a um, you know, a theme in other sectors of society. And when I went to Ukraine, similarly, um, I had a strong sense of who I was, but I really did encounter some difficult things. I mean, I think it's important not to, um, not to sweep that under the carpet. You know, there was anti-Semitism that I encountered there. Um, in a different way than I had in the United States. Um, and I wanna, I wanna kind of pause here and just emphasize that this is completely, completely different than what Putin is trying to say right now that Ukraine needs to be denazified or that there's a Nazi problem in Ukraine. This is you know, a completely ridiculous story he's putting together, um, taking like threads of you know, instances here and there that really amount to very, very little in the greater perspective. So I just wanna be clear about that. But, for me personally, it was still part of my journey there. And um, again, as I mentioned earlier, there were days where I kind of questioned, what am I doing here? What would my what would my relatives think? They'd roll over in their graves or what would my rabbis think? But um, you know, just the truth of the relations that I experienced there, my friends, the people who, who were like family to me, who took care of me while I was sick and um, all the research I was doing, um, really held me in place there and um, helped ground me, um, gave me the courage to continue doing those explorations in a really safe way, feeling safe, feeling, um, you know, that if God forbid there were another Holocaust, that these people would take me in, that they would hide me, that they would get me food, you know? Little did I know at the time that um, they would be the ones that would be targeted, um, you know, in this current war and that I might be in a position to bring them food or to bring them supplies. But that's, a, that's another, probably for another question. But um, you know, eventually after I had that moment on that dusty road, um, you know, picking through my shame, picking, picking through my desire for reconciliation and kind of eventually finding my own, my own voice, my own calling, my own role, um, I, I did work in Ukraine as sort of a Jewish representative in different contexts, but I sort of felt like I was maxing out on what I could provide. And um, also in divinity school, I had been more of a generalist. I really wanted to be a spiritual resource for people of all backgrounds, not just Jews. And so these things kind of kept me from actually applying to rabbinical school, which had been something people all, all throughout my life had been suggesting to me, why don't you go to rabbinical school? And I just kind of brushed it aside. And then um, I discovered Hebrew College, which is a pluralistic rabbinical school. And I had several conversations with them leading up to my application where I, I wanted to be really truthful about who I was, that I saw myself as an ambassador of the Jewish people, not necessarily um, someone who would 
situate myself squarely in the midst of a Jewish community, but more outwardly facing. And they said that was fine, that they needed people like that. And um, I said, well, you know, I'm really comfortable in a pluralistic setting. That's great. We need people like that. And so I just kept getting green lights and I decided, okay, you know, maybe this is where I might be headed. And um, so far it's been a, a wild ride there. Um, they were also really, uh, one of the things I should say back up a little is that they were really interested in the fact that I had spent significant time in Ukraine. And um, they recognized, overall, I would say they recognized that Ukraine is not only significant for the Jews and that it was the birthplace of the Hasidic mov movement, and also the root of so many of our um, Ashkenazic stories, family stories. But I think they saw a real opportunity here also for grappling with some difficult history and for finding allies in the sense of um, a pluralistic, multi-ethnic, thriving society, um, democratic society. So I think um, that felt like a really warm, uh, hook <laughs> to, to anchor on at Hebrew College. Also, the fact that I could continue doing work in Ukraine and continue that part of my world. So. Um, that really leads us into the next question. Um, we've been speaking of your Jewish identity and your Jewish journey, pulling back a bit into right now in 2022. We've all been following the interest um, throughout the Jewish community and the wider community to the story of a democratically elected Jewish leader in a historically anti-Jewish nationalist area of the world. I'm curious about, we would spoken years back about this, and I'm curious how you reflect now on your impression of Zelensky's Jewish identity um, on his election and on his popularity in Ukraine, how were you feeling during this period as a Jew? There's a large sense of pride in the community, um, but there's a funny feeling of how is a Jewish person leading this country, leading this war? Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on Zelensky, on his rise to power, as, as we can call it? Um, in such a, such a questionable place? Great, well, um, great question. And um, it begs so many different answers. First of all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call Ukraine um, anti-Jewish or you know, hostile towards Jews at all. And I think, um, but I'm, I'm glad you said that. And I think that that's um, a very, very common and understandable impression that many of us have. Um, as I said earlier, I sort of was um, maybe lucky or, foolish to escape that part of our narrative. But um, as, I, as I researched and studied, you know, we do have a strong um, impression of Ukrainians as anti-Semitic. And some of that is founded, you know, based on the instances of horror that we've experienced in that land over the, over the centuries. But um, it's, really, it's really a small part of the overall experience. And, um, it, I feel like it really needs to be balanced with other, other narratives as well. And the fact that Zelensky um, is president of Ukraine um, speaks to a few different things. Um, when I was there, it was around the election time. I was a little bit nervous that um, if he was going to be hated, it was going to be because of him being Jewish or you know, somehow he'd use his Judaism to try to appeal to different parts of society. But it was just from my perspective, absolutely a non-issue. There was very, very little said about him being Jewish at all. So I think number one, that speaks to the fact that um, Ukraine is in fact quite hospitable for people of all different backgrounds to even run for president and be elected with, you know, I think it was um, three fourths of the vote, very, very high margin. Um, and I think also his own Jewish identity is part of who he is, but I, I haven't seen him really highlighting that at all. I mean, he grew up um, speaking Russian as many Jews did. His parents were scientists. Um, he speaks about his history, but he doesn't really, I don't think it's a really big active part of his life, his Jewish identity. I think he's really um, very much just a Ukrainian citizen. And 
as was often the case, a lot of Jews in Ukraine um, over the Soviet Union didn't really have the opportunity to practice their religion or even know or learn about their religion. And so I think um, he's a product of that legacy of Judaism that was sort of a stamp in your passport, but not really an active cultural life at all. So again, I don't think it's anything that he's ashamed of or hides, but I don't think he's, he's had the opportunity or interest in um, delving into that part of his identity. So um, I, I, I know that a lot of Jews outside of Ukraine are very tickled by the fact that he's Jewish and um, fascinated by it. And if anything, I just, the non-issue of it speaks to the fact that um, it's very possible for someone like that to become president easily in Ukraine. It was, it was more of an issue that he was sort of seen as a populist and um, a social media campaigner and a comedian who played a president on TV. So I think that was more the uh, discourse around when he was running for president. That's fascinating, Michelle. Um, staying in today's world, I, I know in our, our conversations personally, the question is always, what do your friends and colleagues report today? I know you're still in close touch. And, and like you've mentioned, you have many uh, relationships who feel like family to you now. Um, so I'm curious what you're hearing, how they're feeling, what academia is looking like right now. Um, anywhere you'd like to take that question. Sure, sure. Um, and thank you for asking that too. Um, you know, what strikes me most is the incredible unity and resilience that I'm seeing right now in Ukraine, among Ukrainians, among my friends, almost uniformly, no matter what their personal experiences are, um, ranging from uh, a lot of, lot of violence, experiencing a lot of violence, being bombed, um, you know, having to run in and out of the bomb shelters, fleeing, being becoming refugees or internally displaced people, or um, living in a relatively safe part of the country, no matter where they are, um, almost everybody is just so um, united right now. This is such a clear um, a clear war in terms of, you know, a sovereign, peaceful nation being violently invaded by a hostile neighbor. So, um, you know, I have one friend who was actually um, a Yiddish teacher at the Jewish studies program that I alluded to earlier. She lived in Kharkiv in an apartment with her parents and, um, you know, they were being bombed and tried to stay there. They were going up and down the 10 flights of stairs to the, to the bomb shelter at the bottom of their building. Her parents have some mobility issues, so it was hard for them. And eventually they decided to just stay in their their apartment and risk it. And she was singing, she was baking bread, really trying to do life affirming things. When they were in the shelter, they were telling jokes with other people there. Um, this was in the beginning, you know, beginning of the current war. Um, and then eventually they had the opportunity to, to get out and they went to Lviv um, in Western Ukraine and then eventually on to Germany. So that's one, one story. Um, Jewish family also, by the way, and um, I had other friends uh, from Kiev in the capital who moved to Lviv temporarily, but have since been able to go back to Kiev. Um, and most of my friends are in Lviv because that's where I lived. And um, you know, they're, they're finding ways to make themselves useful, whether it's doing lots of volunteer translating or lots of um, greeting people who are fleeing at the train station, providing soup and blankets and hugs, um, or whether it's um, continuing to teach. A lot of my friends who are connected with the universities, you asked about academia, um, almost immediately conferences were continuing, workshops were continuing, classes were continuing. Um, I guess thanks to COVID, everybody has the paradigm and structure to be online. And so, you know, some of the students have become refugees, um, but are doing their best to plug into classes and exams are going on. So, you know, teachers are sometimes in other countries now too, who have fled, but um, university life is continuing as best as possible, albeit with very regular interruptions from the air raid sirens that go off at all times of day and night. So, um, 
you know, depending on where my friends are, they're either plugging into relief efforts, service opportunities. Um, and then, you know, occasionally there are pretty devastating stories also, you know, about loved ones being killed, um, you know, when a building collapses or, um, you know, being drafted and then eventually being, you know, a, a casualty of the war. So, um, because of where I happen to have been situated, most of my friends are in Western Ukraine. So I don't have a lot of personal contacts in the places that have experienced the worst of the, um, the, the violence and torture and rapes and murders and, and things like that. But um, you know, I think we've talked about it, that those stories um, that we've all heard are just identical to the Holocaust stories that we grew up with. And you know, the names might be slightly different, but um, the situations are, are pretty much identical. And it's, it's just really visceral to, to hear those stories happening again now. But overall, I mean, the picture is really one of unity and resilience. Thank you. I know it's hard to talk about, um, especially when the war began, you and I spoke about how familiar it looked. Um, and I remember making a comment, it's, it's like having your Starbucks bombed. And you said exactly <laughs> being, you know, with the, the cities looking very familiar to us in America, you know, we, we still often our, our visual references go to a fiddler on the roof um, picture. And we know that's not the case today. So thank you for sharing your stories of your friends and colleagues. Um, moving a bit away from the personal uh, and back to your professional work, how has the war affected your relationship building work? Um, by just knowing you, I, I know you're an optimist and you're a doer. So I can't imagine that, that that's it, you know, there's a war, we can't continue. Um, but what are your next steps aside from finishing rabbinical school, which I know takes a little bit of your, of your time, um, a feat in and of itself. Where, where are we, where are we today? What could you see happening ideally in a post COVID post war reality? If we can imagine what that could look like. You know, I, I would really hope that, um, the support that we've been seeing among, uh, Jews, particularly in America and other countries and Americans in general, and I think the world, most of the world, I hope that that support for Ukraine and Ukrainians will continue. Um, hopefully, may it end soon, the, the current threat and violence. Um, and I, I think that there will be a huge need for rebuilding and supporting Ukraine in, um, you know, economically, for sure, infrastructurally, um, politically, I think um, in my own professional sphere, I only regret that we haven't already established that exchange program because I, I have this feeling throughout this current time that that could have been something really useful. Um, and, and all hope is not lost. You know, it's not impossible to, to continue those ties or to build those ties even now. But, um, I, you know, I, I hope that also there will be let me back up and say, um, you know, when I first started going to Ukraine in 2002, I was met with um, some significant skepticism or indifference in the Jewish community in the United States. And um, again, understandable given our history, our, our difficult history, um, people were concerned, it might have touched on fears or aversions that they had. But now, um, I have seen none of that. I've only seen an outpouring of support and interest and concern and care. And I think it's, um, I try to understand it. And I think it's not just because of the moral clarity of the situation. And it's not just because of the links that many of us feel to that land and the resemblance of, as we were talking about the Holocaust stories and other atrocities. But I think that things have actually just changed over time. You know, I think more Jews have gone to Ukraine from here. Um, often the, the impetus is to explore family roots and genealogy or to make pilgrimage to the um, Hasidic sites. But I think 
more and more people, once they're there, are discovering a country that really is very different than our um, kind of nostalgic images of Fiddler on the Roof, you know, um, seeing like, you know, the coffee shops and the bustling city life and people of all different backgrounds and, um, you know, international students and, and whatnot. So I think, um, and I think Ukraine has definitely evolved also. I think that um, I've seen huge efforts in the short time that I've been going there among people to really delve into the Jewish history and to recognize that Jewish history is an essential part of Ukrainian history and um, to really you know, come to terms with some of the, the ugliness and the pain and to um, build true understanding that's not you know, the kind that I made with that, that man <laughs> with the holy water and the Jews poisoning the well, but to really look carefully at what happened, to be honest about it and to see where we can go from that. And where, where can we, where can we from a place of empowerment, um, how can we build a future that is healthier and stronger because of our acknowledgement of the past. So I think that that was already happening when this war started. And so, yes, the moral clarity, yes, the historic links we have, but also just natural progression and, and these um, trends developing over time. So I'm really, I'm hopeful that this burst of support that is provoked by this atrocious situation will hopefully continue and, um, you know, the cynical part of myself understands the media cycle and that um, a new crisis might come along and, and this might fall off our radar. Um, I really hope it doesn't. I think that um, America has deep connections and ties to Ukraine as well for geopolitical reasons. So I, I hope that that helps keep it on the radar screen a little bit more. But I think this, this huge reversal that I've seen in the Jewish community in the United States um, will help propel these initiatives and support efforts forward going into the future. Again, fascinating. Thank you. It's so hard to acknowledge and appreciate a silver, a silver lining in difficult times, but I think it's part of our heritage um, that we do that to, to continue and, and be strong. So it's always interesting to hear how these silver linings affect someone personally and professionally. Um, and in your case, both, um, as it continues to um, intercept, intersect with our peoplehood story. Um, I'm looking at some of the questions that people have sent in. And a few people have asked about thoughts on cultural differences today in Ukraine compared to the past. Um, if that's something you can speak on or you're familiar to, I, I know you've mentioned what a, a, I don't want to use the word educated, but pluralistic, open-minded community you were a part of um, living in Lviv. Do you know anything about the history there or how it's changed culturally over time or how Jewish life has changed culturally um, before World War II and after or any other time slots in there? Okay. And if you um, can't speak to that, I'm sure we can find something online to direct our uh, No, no, um, our well, definitely. To. There are plenty of people and I'm sure that you'll present people with, um, you know, sources and further resources to, to delve into. But um, I can answer this in a couple of different ways. Um, I think, uh, Looking at um, not necessarily through a Jewish lens, but um, Russian Ukrainian lens. And I, I, I'll speak again from my own perspective, from my own um, experience. When I first started going in 2002, um, I had people tell me um, in certain regions of Ukraine that, oh, we're really um, we're very closely aligned to Russia. We're very, we're almost the same culture. Um, we speak the same language. There was um, a divide that I sensed between Eastern and Western Ukraine, which has been part of the narrative for a long time. Um, and there is truth to it because they've had different cultural influences. So, um, you know, parts of Eastern Ukraine and Central Ukraine were part of the Soviet Union for a whole generation longer than Western Ukraine, who had been under different spheres of influence, Poland and the West and whatnot. So um, there are some divisions, 
but I would say over the course of um, the last 20 years and all of the different revolutions that have happened with each revolution, 2004, 2014, and currently, if you call this a revolution, um, with each moment, I think that Ukraine has become more unified in itself and um, its Ukrainian identity, no matter what language someone grew up speaking, has become more and more distinct from Russian culture. Um, civil society has developed, become a lot stronger. I think, um, in fact, like the free press and um, multicultural, multi-ethnic reality and identity has become stronger. Um, democracy has become stronger. So I think all of these things, and with every Russian attack on those things, um, philosophically, psychologically, militarily, I think it's only come to fortify Ukraine even more. So now I think this idea of um, two Ukraines, one that's more towards Russia and one that's more towards the West, I think that's become a thing of the past very quickly. And so I think that's an important point to note. Um, it, you know, People used to think that, oh, the people in the Donbass, the, the region right now that's under attack, um, you know, they, oh, might as well, like they wanna be part of Russia anyway, I think, less and less you know now especially over the last eight years um since russia first attacked in 2014 i think they've become even stronger um ukrainians and more unified so and i think people in the west who might have you know had certain opinions about russian speakers in the east have since dropped a lot of those stereotypes as well and really um that's what i mean about unity ukrainian unity i think that's become very strong and very grounded um, other cultural differences i've seen um personally throughout the last 20 years um i think again this trend of growing interest in jewish culture and other multi-ethnic histories um I think that, you know, like lots of parts of Europe and the United States and Eastern Europe in particular, there, there's um, an issue of racism, but I have seen even that um, issue become uh, dealt with in a much healthier way. I've seen people talk about it, people confront it, want to work on it. Um, so I think that there's been a lot of development and growth um, culturally. I'm not sure if this is getting at the question exactly. Um, you know, I think you mentioned World War II, and I obviously wasn't there during that time, so I can't speak to that directly. Cultural shifts, I think there, you know, as I alluded to, there have been different spheres of influence um, and depends on where you are in Ukraine, what those spheres were. Thank you, it was a, a hard question. Um, I know beyond, your personal experience. So thank you for giving us kind of that pulled back view. Um, to later today, we'll be sending out a follow up to this program as we only had an hour. And I know there are so many questions and so many nuances to each question. We're going to include for all of you in the audience um, some references for further learning that Michelle is recommending. Um, before we send that out, Michelle, would you like to share a little bit about what you've asked us to include, um, a little background perhaps on the article in um, the Times for some of the books you've recommended? Yeah, sure. So um, it's the um, Time Magazine article uh, written by Yaroslav Fritzak, who is um, a very prominent figure, um, a historian, Ukrainian historian, which being a historian in Ukraine is a little different than being an historian in the United States. So he's really quite a public figure, has a great um, view on Ukrainian Jewish relations. And in this article focusing on um, sort of the history of Ukrainian Russian relations and that relationship and how, um, how these two um, identities have just really developed very differently and have different influences. And, um, I think it's a really important, an important and very timely read. Um, the book Bloodlands by Timothy Snyder is a very comprehensive look historically at um, Ukraine and this this region um, as you know being um, under the sphere sometimes of the Soviet Union and sometimes under the sphere of um, Nazi Germany and how so much blood has been shed there. 
Um, and so I think that's a really, that's a great comprehensive read. Um, what else did I suggest to you? Um, I think there was, um, I'm going to just check on my notes. To see if you have that list, I can speak to some of them specifically. We can, um, we'll include your list. And after the program, we can talk about if there's any footnotes you'd like to add to, you know, explain why you included each one. But that was a great introduction um, and will help make sense of a little context um, before all of us delve farther in. Yeah, actually, there's one more I would um, highlight. Um, I just pulled up my notes, and I, I don't know why this slipped off my radar, but um, the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter is a wonderful organization and website to explore um, that really goes in, again, to some of the nuances in this complicated and um, very rich history that we share and some of the initiatives that are happening now. There's some excellent scholars, um, really top-notch scholars associated with this organization. Um, so I would highly recommend that as a web, you know, a resource. You can look at articles and listen to videos and um, things like that. So I think that's a great one too. Thank you. With just about seven minutes left before uh, most of us go back to work or onto where we are in our day, um, I wanted to see if you have any last thoughts to share today, be it on the war or your work or your journey. Um, what our audience can leave with um, after listening to you today, reading the newspaper, watching the news, every everything that's hitting us from different angles. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of multiple multiple truths as we've talked about, um, and I'm wondering what you'd like our audience to take with them today after this talk. Yeah, um, great question. Well, there's, there's so much, it's such a big topic. And um, there are a couple small points, which are, um, well, not small, very important points, but specific to the situation right now. And that is to really consider the social media and the news that you're consuming and to pay close attention to the Russian propaganda that has definitely infiltrated our media as well. So to really um, be astute and vigilant about checking sources and um, if you don't know yourself something, then consulting people you trust, um, looking at websites you trust. Um, this rhetoric about denazifying Ukraine is, um, as I mentioned earlier, just completely ridiculous. And um, this gets me to sort of my bigger point, which is that this doesn't mean that Ukrainians are perfect and that Ukraine has never had any anti-Semitism in it or never will or doesn't currently but it is completely blown out of proportion and used to justify just so many atrocities that we've been witnessing. So I wanna encourage people to really think twice about um, that message. Um, but also I want to encourage people to um, not deny the difficult parts of our history either because um, doing that is making ourselves victims to false narratives. So I think it's very important to um, you know, if, if, if you come from a Jewish background, especially an Ashkenazic Jewish background, to be honest about the history that, that we have in Ukraine, the good parts and the not so good parts. Um, it was, you know, a big part of my journey coming to terms with some of that, dealing with my emotions and my feelings uh, when I was first there and um, grappling with those messages that I had received um, in preparation for that trip, you know, that Ukraine was uh, a hostile place full of Nazis and they all wanted to kill me. And, um, you know, when I saw these swastikas on the walls or heard Jewish jokes, I, I felt horrible, but I had to really pause and look more broadly and to not deny that part of the, the ugly part of our history, the painful part, but also to think about all those people who, who are brave enough to confront that difficult history and to be honest about it and to reach out currently to support Jews, to support Jews reclaiming um, grave sites that have been um, ignored in Ukraine um, over the years. There's so many efforts right now to call attention to these, these historic places where Jews once thrived, um, to have conferences to educate Ukrainians about the Jewish history, to confront stereotypes and rhetoric and to really look closely at what's going on. So there's so many of these efforts happening in Ukraine 
And um, even without those um, concerted efforts, just the, the natural warmth and welcome that I received really helped me to balance some of that difficult history. And then confronting some of those views back home, you know, um, sharing my personal experiences about Ukraine um, and helping Jews here to understand that not all Ukrainians want to kill them and not all Ukrainians are Nazis, you know. So I think that this is really important to stay on top of. Um, another thing I want to point out is that the situation can be so crippling and overwhelmingly horrible when we read about these rapes and murders and um, disruptions of everyday life in, in big and small ways um, and the violence that's occurring again after we um, swore never again and, and here it is happening again and it's not the first time you know Ukraine is right now um, experiencing such um, such extreme violence but this has happened in other places since the Holocaust so I think um, thinking very carefully about not falling prey to hopelessness, to knowing that we can do things to help. As horrible as it is, we can continue to train ourselves to be better bystanders, even when we witness microaggressions in our own spheres, in our own worlds. We can continue to support Ukraine financially, specifically right now, helping the military, helping humanitarian and medical aid, um, aid efforts, and, um, you know, again, staying on top of fake news is very important, looking at what we can do to prevent authoritarians like this from taking hold in the first place. So I think that there's a lot that we can do. And I, I would hope that people walk away from this hour feeling um, maybe intrigued and interested to learn more and also encouraged to do something and to feel hopeful that despite our difficult history, um, we can actually move forward together in a really positive and supportive way in, in search of freedom and true reconciliation. Wow, definitely. Um, Michelle, we've got two minutes left. Um, thank you for sharing your time with us today and helping us find new routes to questioning, analyzing, and understanding our Jewish stories. Um, speaking with you today has, as always, inspired me to think more deeply and critically, as I believe, based on our audience's questions and feedback already, they're leaving with similar emotions. Um, to those in our international audience today, please keep an eye on, to everybody in our audience today, keep an eye on your email for a follow-up to this talk that I mentioned earlier, and that will include references for further learning, details about the program reporting that I know a few of you have asked about, and a survey so that we can use your feedback to help tailor our programs to your interests. Um, we look forward to seeing you again online next week on May 19th for our next lecture, Strangers at the Gate, A Biblical View of Israelites and Their Neighbors. It will be another Jewish peoplehood exploration. Uh, Michelle, thank you. Thank you to all of, our, all of you out there for joining us. Um, I hope you took some interesting and um, resonant messages with you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky.